Norway and Greenland have signed off on a quota agreement for fishing opportunities in each other's waters for 2023. In a statement released by the Norwegian Ministry for Fisheries, it said that both parties are satisfied with maintaining the good fisheries cooperation and will continue the quota level from the current year. Norwegian fishermen make good use of the quotas in Greenland, and I am satisfied that Norway and Greenland have agreed on a quota agreement for 2023, says Fisheries and Oceans Minister Bjorna Selnes Sharan. Greenland's quota in the Barents Sea in 2023 is set at 4,000 tons of cod, 750 tons of haddock, 650 tons of pollock and 425 tons of bycatch of other species. The Norwegian cod quota is 1,350 tons and the halibut quota 30 tons. The Norwegian halibut quota of 900 tons in West Greenland and 375 tons in East Greenland will be carried forward. The quota for shoals in East Greenland will be 50 tons and the quota for bottom-dwelling redfish will be continued at 500 tons. The quota for bycatch is continued at 325 tons. Greenland halibut is an important resource in Greenland. Halibut is mainly caught by commercial and artisanal bottom longline fishing. Operating fishing boats is more difficult during winter, when sea surface freezes. Therefore, in winter, fishermen travel to the fishing grounds on the sea ice using dog sleds and drill holes in the ice to deploy long lines with metal plate kites. Longline deployment under sea ice has traditionally relied on the empirical knowledge of local Inuit fishermen, and no quantitative reports have been published on longline deployment processes, such as the underwater movement of kites or the range of bottom longline deployment. We investigated these processes during longline deployment using an accelerometer along with pressure and temperature sensor to draw inferences. This is the first quantitative report describing specific operational information on longline fishing under sea ice, specifically on the effects of the kite on longline deployment. The kite is attached to the tip of longline's flutter and can deploy the longlines horizontally over the course of its downward movement towards sea floor. When the kite and mainline were dropped into the sea, the kite extended the line horizontally while shifting back and forth, as well as sideways. The motion resembled the flutter motion primarily influenced by the Reynolds number and moment of inertia. When the main line was holed, the kite descended in a circular motion. The deployment range of the long line was several hundred meters, which was similar to the length commonly used in local commercial fishing. Furthermore, we observed that fishermen pay close attention to operational details during fishing, such as the angle of entry of the main line and the speed of release. It is presumed that they adjust the release and holding of the long line based on their experience and traditional knowledge. There's a reason Norwegian cod is known as white gold among the residents of Alison. This iconic city, nestled amongst the fjords and coastlines of western Norway, simply wouldn't exist without the local fishing industry. The sheer abundance of cod means it doesn't just feed the locals. It also gets exported all over the world, finding its way onto all sorts of menus. In particular, it's the UK's proper fish and chip shops that make the most of it. That's why the Norwegian Seafood Council are heavily involved with the National Fish and Chip Awards, a body that celebrates the shops that consistently produce the best examples of the classic British dish. This year, the 10 finalists for the coveted title of Independent Takeaway Fish and Chip Shop of the Year were invited to Alison for a few days to see where the cod many of them cook with comes from.
I was lucky enough to accompany them. Norway is home to some of the most sustainable fisheries in the world, and tight controls mean stocks have continued to flourish despite increased demand. But this doesn't mean the ships catching the cod are like the small day boats of Cornwall. The ship we were going on, the MS Limebris, cost £31 million to build and looked like something between a super yacht and a miniature cruise ship. It had seven floors home to things like viewing platforms, a cinema and a gym. Despite its size, however, there are usually no more than 24 crew members on board, who will live on the boat for four weeks as it heads deep into the Norwegian and Barents Sea. There are other reasons why the Linebris is so big. Because it's out at sea for up to a month at a time, the fish needs to be frozen before it reaches the shore. As one of Norway's most advanced vessels the ship is kitted out with all the latest technology, including a fully functional processing plant in the belly of the hull. As soon as fish are brought on board they are transported downstairs to be gutted, cleaned, filleted, packaged up and frozen, a process which takes no more than a few minutes from start to finish. Being able to preserve the cod in this way ensures it is as fresh as can be when it reaches the fish and chip shops of the UK. The crew on the Linebris catch cod using the long line method, which is much more environmentally friendly than trawling. It involves one or several lines with lots of hooks attached being shot out of the back of the ship before everything is reeled back in with, hopefully, lots of fish. On the linebris they take this method to the extreme, using a line which can hold up to 50,000 hooks, each of which are automatically baited with a little piece of squid as they are shot out of the ship. We were only on the ship for a day, so rather than 50,000 hooks the crew sent out a couple of thousand. Once they were all in the water we waited for 90 minutes to see how many cod would bite. The bridge on the linebris looked like something out of Star Trek, with all sorts of screens, sonars, keypads and radios, some of which told the skipper where the fish were most likely to be, and while it wasn't a huge catch, there were some nice big fish brought up. The line gets reeled in quite slowly, either depositing smaller fish into a catchment pool within the ship or dragging larger specimens up to a fisherman, poised and ready with a hook and knife to dispatch them quickly and send them down for processing. It was amazing to see all this technology being used in every part of the ship, but there's still no replacement for a skilled fisherman armed with a blade amidst all the computers and automation. Back on dry land, we were treated to some of the delicacies fresh Norwegian cod is turned into in cities like Alessand. Stockfish, dried and salted cod, has been made in the area since Viking times, but nowadays bacalao, a Mediterranean salted cod stew popular in Portugal and Italy, is favoured. We also ate battered cod tongues which were surprisingly firm and meaty, as well as more adventurous dishes at the Klipfish Academy, a centre dedicated to the dried cod and other coastal dishes of Norway. However, it wasn't until a week or two later when I was back in the UK that I really appreciated the flavour of Norwegian cod and the time and effort people put into catching, processing and shipping it across the world. Visiting one of the fish and chip shop finalists for dinner, it was incredible to think the fresh, white, flaky cod inside the crunchy batter had come from the crystal clear waters around Alessand. All too often we dismiss fish and chip shops as takeaways, putting them in the same category as kebab and chicken shops. But when you go to one that really cares about what it sells and sources its fish from ships like the Linebris, they're an inimitable stalwart of what makes British cuisine so great and deserve the same amount of respect as some of our finest traditional restaurants.
The long line is one of the traditional Norwegian fishing techniques, which was first used in the 1500s. It is a long line with floats and sinkers to keep it at the right depth for cod fishing. On the line there are branch lines, or snoods, attached about 3 feet, or 1 meter, apart. The snoods have baited hook. Traditionally the long line's hooks are baited on land and then coiled into an open bucket. The bucket is then brought to the fishing banks and then played out on from the boat. The long line is classified as a passive tool because when placed at the ocean it does not move, but attracts the fish by the smell of the bait. The line stays in the water for four to five hours, sometimes more. Pulling in the line was hard work and the longest lines could have 1,000 hooks. Traditionally one of the crew pulled the line over a wooden roller while another gaffed the fish and threw them on board. Traditionally the long line and snoods were made of natural fibers, but today the ropes are synthetic. The Modern longliners have mechanical autoline systems and can set and haul up to 30.00 hooks. There are many positive effects from using the longline today compared to other fishing methods. The fish have far better quality with a firmer and whiter flesh. Also the seabed is not harmed using the longline, there are rarely any ghost fishing and you only get the selected catch. In addition the method is more energy saving and have a smaller carbon footprint. For decades, the go-to bait for cod fishing in Norway has been pike, or perp. This is completely understandable, as it is very easy to fish, even in deeper water and strong currents, and it certainly catches a lot of fish. But we have a lot of fun for you. By switching to lighter gear and choosing game instead of perks, you'll catch more big fish. Jewel Stein, co-founder and Norway expert, shares his knowledge with you so you can improve your catch, too. Get ready to collect more cod and larger attitude fish than you ever thought possible. Let me get one thing straight first, predators are certainly effective. In particular, cod are easily attracted to this shiny, vibrating metal. Another advantage of bait is that anyone can fish this bait without experience. Simply release the piling tool, let it sink until it reaches the correct depth and start cutting it. Give it a strong blow and let it fall, that's it. Most anglers choose to use a furry cod or a false octopus on a cod, perk head to increase their chances of catching smaller cod. And yes, it works because catching two, three or more fish in one go is not exceptional. This all seems easy, doesn't it? Catching lots of fish with ease. What's not to like? Well, to be honest there are quite a few things I don't like. The most important reasons why I choose not to use a briquetting machine are I like the softer handling because it's much more fun. So I want to share my passion for soft bait fishing so you can improve your catches and have more fun. And when you return to your motel after a fun day of fishing, you're more likely to have sore muscles from fighting fish instead of fishing for big perk all day. Norway is known for the incredible amount of cod that can be caught there. By using soft baits instead of jigs, you'll catch more fish and have more fun doing it. 
Fishing with plastic lures requires a little more explanation than fishing with lures. But once you know how, your Norwegian fishing holiday will never be the same again. Get ready to catch more fish, more species and last but not least, bigger fish. First, let's see which correct handling is best used. Personally, I prefer fishing with heavy spinning rods and spinning reels rather than boat fishing rod. The reason is that you have to release soft baits instead of letting them fall under the boat. These days, there are plenty of high-quality yet affordable spinning rods available for Norway that have enough power to defeat a 100-plus pound flounder if that monster takes the bait. A good example of this type of fishing rod is the Spro Salty Beast Nano Mega Jig Spin. At 7 feet long, it's perfect for maneuvering in the boat, and you can throw any jig head weighing 4 to 6 ounces, 113 to 170 grams, all day long. This rod requires a high-quality saltwater spinning reel between 6,000 and 8,000 gauge, spooled with 30 to 50 pounds braid. Fishing with nylon is simply impossible. Too much tension, too much resistance. Just braid a nice braid. The thinner the braid, the lighter the jig head you can use, but I recommend choosing no less than 30 pounds. 40 pounds braid is definitely a good average, giving you enough power to catch cod, coalfish and even the largest flounder. Coalfish, safe in Norwegian, is pretty much the tuna of the north. They attack the bait super aggressively, swim really fast, fight like crazy, and can even be caught on popper lures. Atlantic cod, Gardus morhua, is the most iconic fish species for Iceland. A large, fast-growing, tasty fish, the cod plays a major role in the Icelandic marine ecosystem. Common catch sizes of cod range from 50 to 100 centimeters, but the largest individual recorded in Icelandic waters was 186 centimeters in length. The growth rate is dependent on food availability and ocean conditions which subsequently affect maturity and reproduction. In late winter, the cod spawns all around Iceland, but the largest and most important fishing grounds are off the southwestern coast. One of the reasons for the cod's success is its omnivorous eating habits, which varies with size and age. Starting with zooplankton as a juvenile, a mature cod increasingly feeds on other fish. Cod fisheries are conducted all year round mainly using bottom trawl and longline. Management measures implemented over the years following periods of overfishing have contributed to the recovery of the stock. With an annual tack, total allowable catch, as low as 130,000 tons during the bleakest period, the tack has gradually been increased and is now over 250,000 tons. Haddock, Melanogramma sigilfinus, is a rather large codfish found in high abundance in Icelandic waters, most common on soft seabed. Typical catch size is 50 to 65 centimeters long but can exceed 100 centimeters. The haddock is primarily a benthic feeder but welcomes capelin and sand eel when available. The life cycle of the haddock is similar to that of the cod. Landings of haddock have ranged from 34,000 to 120,000 tons since 1950. A large share of the catch is exported chilled, especially to the UK. Saith, Pollock, Pollockius virens, is another species of a large codfish, generally caught when 50 to 100 centimetres long. Distributed all around Iceland, the saith can be categorised as benthopelagic. Spawning takes place earlier than for other codfishes. Feeding primarily on krill as a juvenile, saith adds capelin and sand eel to its diet as it matures. In historic terms, safe has been a commercially important species for Icelanders. Annual catches have commonly ranged from 30,000 to 130,000 tons. Processed in a similar way as cod and haddock, safe is primarily exported to Germany, either filleted or headed and gutted, fresh or frozen. 
Ling, Molva Molva, is common in Icelandic waters. It is usually 65 to 110 centimeters in length when caught but can grow beyond 200 centimeters and live to the ripe age of 25. Catches of ling have for decades been in the range of 4,000 to 8,000 tons per year. The blue ling, Molva Birklange, is smaller than the ling and of a sleeker build. The total catch of the blue ling in recent decades has ranged from 1,000 to 6,900 tons. The tusk, Brosmi Brosmi, is a common codfish in Icelandic waters, commonly 40 to 90 centimeters in length when caught. For more than 50 years, the annual catch has ranged from 5,000 to 8,000 tons with a few exceptions. Whiting, Merlingius merlangus, has primarily been caught as a bycatch of limited commercial significance but is now being monitored as a targeted stock by the Marine and Freshwater Research Institute. The Atlantic variety of snow crab occurs in the northeastern Atlantic, near the west coast of Greenland and south to the Gulf of Maine. Snow crabs prefer cold water temperatures and occur at a wide range of depths, from 20 to 2,000 meters, most often on sandy or muddy bottoms. Snow crabs are spider-like in shape, with a flat, round carapace, shell, and long, slender legs. Their color changes as they age. Soon after they molt, snow crabs will be reddish on top and white on the bottom. As they get older, this red will fade to a duller olive shade and their underside will become yellowish. Snow crabs can grow to a maximum carapace width of about 15 centimeters, with males growing more than twice as large as females. Females are not harvested commercially for this reason. They have a maximum lifespan of 12 to 13 years. Snow crab, Chionoicetes opalio, is a subarctic species found in the northern hemisphere. They are found in the Sea of Japan to the Bering Sea, Alaska and British Columbia. They also extend from West Greenland down the Canadian Atlantic coast to Nova Scotia. Recently, they have been observed and or introduced into the North and Barents Seas. Habitat preferences are soft mud bottoms. Smaller crabs are found in more complex habitats with shelter. Larger crab are found at depths from 50 to 300 meters and temperatures from minus 1 to 11 degrees Celsius on the Scotian shelf. Extended exposure to temperatures greater than 7 degrees Celsius are thought to be detrimental to snow crab. Their primary food include shrimp, fish, capelin and lumpfish, starfish, sea urchins, worms, detritus, large zooplankton, other crabs, ocean quahaug, mollusks, sea snails and sea anemones. Predators of snow crab are halibut, skates, especially thorny skate, cod, seals, American plice, squids, and other crabs. Crab in the size range of 3 to 30 mm carapace width, CW, are particularly vulnerable to predation as a soft-shelled crab in the spring molting season. A female snow crab produces from 16,000 to 160,000 eggs in the spring which are brooded by the mothers for up to two years, depending upon ambient temperatures, food availability. Eggs are hatched from late spring to early summer when they become pelagic, zoea stages 1 and 2 in the intermediate megalope stage, feeding upon plankton. After three to five months in the pelagic stage, they settle to the bottom in late autumn and winter. Bottom-dwelling post-larval stages, instars, molt approximately twice a year until they reach instar 5 after which they generally molt once a year, up to a terminal molt which occurs somewhere between instars 9 to 14 for males and 9 to 11 for females. Snow crab can become sexually mature by the ninth instar. Prior to the terminal molt, male crab may skip a molt in one year to molt in the next. Male snow crab reach legal size by the 12th instar, representing an age of approximately 9 years since settlement to the bottom. Some males of instar 11 will also be within legal size. Females begin to molt to maturity at an average size of approximately 55 mm CW and mate between winter, spring while the carapace is still soft. Complex behavioral patterns have been observed, 
The male helps the female remove her shell during her molt, protects her from other males and predators and even feeds her, indirectly. Pair formations, mating embrace where the male holds the female, have been seen to occur up to three weeks prior to mating. Upon larval release, males have been seen to wave the females about to help disperse the larvae. Females are selective in their mate choice and may die in the process of resisting mating attempts from unsolicited males. Males compete heavily for females and often injure themselves or the females, losing appendages, while contesting over a female. Once terminally molted, snow crab can live up to six more years, under optimal conditions. This means that females can reproduce two or more times, depending upon environmental conditions. The carapace condition rapidly deteriorates in the last year of its life, a stage that is generally associated with a mossy and decalcified carapace. Between molts, the crab builds more organic tissues and prepares a new shell under the old one. When this process is completed and the conditions are suitable, the body shell splits at the back and the crab molts by backing slowly out of the old shell. Large crabs may take up to 10 hours to emerge from the old shell. Immediately after molting, the wrinkled, soft crab takes up water and swells to its new size in a few hours. The soft shell, covering all the body and the legs, gradually hardens and again, more muscles and other tissues grow inside, replacing the water that was absorbed at molting. It may take two months or more depending upon temperatures and food availability for a large mature crab to lose its soft shell condition. The snow crab fishery in eastern Canada began in 1960 with incidental by catches by groundfish draggers near Gaspé, Quebec. Its development was slow until the 1980s when it began expanding rapidly to become one of the largest fisheries in Canada, in terms of landings and landed value. On the Scotian shelf, the fishery has been in existence since the early 1970s with landings at levels of 1,000 t. By 1979, this rose to 1,500 t subsequent to which the fishery declined substantially in the mid-1980s. A large pulse of recruitment to the fishery was observed in 1986. Total landings increased to record levels of approximately 10,000 t each year in the early 2000s. The spatial distribution of total landings has shifted from being mostly derived from inshore areas in the past, 2000 to 2002, to mostly from the offshore areas. Females have no commercial value due to their smaller size. This serves to protect their reproductive capacity from harm from human exploitation. On the Scotian shelf, the snow crab fishery is managed as three main areas, NENS, SENS and CFA4X. There is no biological basis for these spatial divisions. They represent ad hoc divisions based upon political, social, economic and historical convenience. In 2005, many areas and sub-areas were merged, except for crab fishing areas, CFAs, 23A, 23 and 24. Similarly, fishing seasons have evolved for economic, safety and conservation considerations. Severe weather conditions, catch of soft shell and white crab, disruption of mating periods, and overlap with other fisheries, especially lobster. In particular, the CFA 4X season was set to run from the beginning of November to the end of May, completely disjoint from the ENS fishing period of June to September. The rationale for this choice was that better quality snow crab were caught during this period for the commercial market with the least amount of overlap with the lobster season. From 1982 to 1993, the management of the NNSCNS fisheries was based on effort controls, size, sex, shell hardness, season, license, trap limits. Additional management measures were introduced from 1994 to 1999, individual boat quotas, IBQs, total allowable catches, tax, 100% dockside monitoring, mandatory logbooks and at sea monitoring by certified observers, currently, 5%, 10%, and 10% in NENS, SENS, and CFA4X, respectively. Vessel monitoring systems, VMS, have been gradually implemented in this fishery, 